Uh, you guys, it's been a great day so far, and I'm excited about all the speakers we have for you this afternoon. But I wanted to share some stuff with you. Um, I make this magazine called Found Magazine, and it's all notes and letters that people find on the ground, find on the street. Love letters, to-do lists, journal entries, anything that people have found. So I brought some all-time favorites with me, uh, some brand new ones that I've collected. I also, as I mentioned, work for a radio show called This American Life, and I had a piece on the air a couple years ago, but a couple days before the show aired, my boss, Ira Glass, came to me. He said, we're going to have to bleep out. We have to censor like the most important words of the story, the title of the story. So I got permission to give you the uncensored version uh, this afternoon. So we'll, we'll dig into that in just a moment. But uh, let me tell you how I found started. You know, I, I was living in Chicago, and I came out to my car one day, and I found on my windshield this note addressed to Mario. My name is Davey, so I'm like, all right, what's this all about? I opened it up. It said, Mario, I hate you. You said you had to work. Why is your car here at her place? You're a liar. I hate you. I hate you. Signed, Amber. P.S. Page me later. <laughs> and she, she's so angry and upset, but still hopeful and in love. And of course, it wasn't even Mario's car, it was my car. So I started showing this amazing note to my friends, and, and they surprised me. Every one of my friends had collected some found note of their own, maybe a kid's drawing, a Polaroid picture, some love letter or to-do list. So I started collecting these, and I thought a magazine, found magazine, would be a great way for everyone to share what they're finding with everybody else. So I, I brought some favorites. This one came from New York, my friend in uh, Brooklyn found this on the street in front of her apartment. It's written to a guy named Delane. It says, Dear Delane, you and I are just friends. That's the way I wish to remain. I like you, but only as a friend. I would be happy if this doesn't affect our bond as friends. <laughs> Please understand, it's not because you're not handsome enough. It's just because you and I are friends and that's it. The reason you can't be my boyfriend is because I'm not as attracted to you as you are to me. To be honest, I just want us to be friends, that's all. <laughs> it's your choice whether you want to be my friend or not. Signed, Julia. P.S. Let's just be friends. <laughs> <laughs> and so the woman that found this, you know, she says she wonders if Delane ever got the subtle hint that Julia just wanted to be friends. Uh, in fact, you know, love and relationships are clearly on a lot of people's minds. So many of the finds we receive seem to deal with this kind of stuff. And this one came from Portland, Oregon. It seems like it's a guy who's counseling his friend who's in the very, very early stages of a relationship. He's just trying to give him some advice. So he says, don't rush things. Be her friend first. Take her out for lunch. Uh, ask her, would you like to go out for lunch? <laughs> My treat, please. Come on, please. So I like how he's, you know, like anticipating rejection for his friend before he's even had a chance. <laughs> and then in San Francisco, uh, this woman told me she got to work in the morning and she found in the office fax machine these three mysterious faxes that had come through in the middle of the night. No idea who they were from. Just these handwritten faxes, but they got the time code up top so you can see when they came in. And the first one's from 2.36 a.m. It says, I just want Gigi back. Tell me where she is and I'll come get her. Why are you doing this? Be a man. <laughs> Whoa. Whoa. Uh, the next one, a few minutes later, it says, this is cruel and emotional abuse. No wonder you drive the women you're with crazy. They either join cults or want to kill themselves. Be a man for once in your life. The world doesn't revolve around you. Just let me have Gigi now. I can't believe you're even doing this. I will come get her. If not, I'm calling the police. All right. And finally, the last fax at 2.56 a.m., it just says, sorry, wrong number. <laughs> <laughs> and you look at the bottom, there's like, I don't know if you can see up front, there's a drawing. It's kind of like a, a oops, my bad face. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> now, if, if, you, if you live near school, if you work at a school, you know that kids are great at losing stuff. And the stuff they lose is usually pretty incredible. So my friend's a middle school teacher in Houston, Texas, and he found this one day out in the playground. It says at the top, Erica Rioja, in big letters, Erica Rioja. Erica, we the boys want to know, why are you going out with Nathan <laughs> when you like all of us in a way? Tell us why and list how much you like the person with their name. For example, Fred, not at all. <laughs> Sorry for asking you all these questions, but we the boys want to know and get to the bottom of this. <laughs> I'm always having to write these letters because the rest of the boys, they are some punks. Me, Fred, and Ricky thought of writing to you, well, really, it was just Fred. All the boys in the sixth grade likes you except for some. 
That means you are the finest girl in the whole sixth grade. <laughs> a few of them like you because of you know what. But I don't. I like you because you're the only girl that has a little piece of hair coming down her face. I think that makes you even prettier. You said that was your own style, and I think that's so cool or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> that's all for now, so I'll see you on the flip side. Peace out. P.S. Call me if you want to talk about something or tell me about myself. <laughs> <laughs> you know my number, and if you don't, then I'll tell you in your ear, because I don't want any other girl but you to know my name, not to know my number, not even Aisha. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm a list maker myself, so I love when we get these found to-do lists. People send them in all the time, and this was a one-item to-do list found on an elevator at the Palms Casino Resort in Las Vegas. It just says, must win money. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, here's one from St. Louis. It says, to do today, turn in library books, find out about college, mail dad's shit, write crystal, <laughs> hide guns. And <laughs> from Atlanta, is, uh, it says, number, uh, to do, number one, go to church, find God, then find myself through God, get baptized. Number two, meet new people, party a lot, start drinking. <laughs> uh, here, here's one from uh, Connecticut, another one in the kids' handwriting. It says, things to do, the first three have been crossed out. Apparently they've been done. Things to do, get a new skateboard deck, crossed out. Get lawn mowing service going, crossed out. Think of band names, crossed out. The last two, still yet to be done. Hook up with Jen, make it to the sixth grade. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So uh, I have some, so a couple last all-time favorite finds to share with you at the end. But let me, let me share this with you. So this is a book I wrote. It's called My Heart is an Idiot. It came out uh, last month in paperback. It's just stories about uh, my own misadventures and love and relationships and interesting people I've met over the last 10 years traveling around doing Found Magazine. Um, but but I, I, one of these pieces is, is from This American Life. Actually, a few of them are, but, but uh, this is one that, that Ira said we're going to have to censor. And I was like, I didn't understand it because there's no curse words. I was like, well, what's the problem? Because the, the piece is called Nibble, Lick, Suck, and Feast. And I was like, is it nibble? Is it feast? Like, which word is so you know, horrible, he said just all four together. You cannot use all four together on public radio. <laughs> <laughs> so I did get permission to give you guys the, the uncensored version uh, uh, this afternoon, and then I'll, I'll wrap up with one or two last favorite finds. But uh, here we go. Uh, Nibble, Lick, Suck, and Feast. What, this, this is about when the first found book came out. We did a 50-state tour because um, there was finds in there from every single state, and the publicity team got us on Letterman's show a few times. It was really fun. Uh, he's an Indiana native himself. Um, we also did a lot of TV stuff that was less glamorous, you know, the morning show in Amarillo, Texas, stuff like that. So this is about some of those experiences. Here it is, here it is. Nibble, lick, suck, and feast. A few years ago, a publisher put together a book I'd put out called Found, based on the annual magazine I produced, which collects love letters, to-do lists, journal entries, photos, and other personal notes that folks around the country have plucked up off the ground of the street. To help spread the word, I bought a van on eBay and hit the road with my brother Peter for an eight-month, 50-state, 136-city tour. The publicity team managed to get me booked on local morning TV shows in most of these cities. How it worked, I'd show up at the station around 6.30 a.m. A producer would clip a little microphone on me, and somewhere between weather and sports, one of the morning show anchors and I would talk about the book for two or three minutes. Early on in the tour, I took these gigs pretty seriously. After all, the publicists and TV stations were clearly doing me a huge favor spreading word about the book. In Philadelphia, Boston, and New York, I made sure to arrive plenty early, act energized, and be prepared with cool found notes to share. But by the third week of the trip, I was starting to wonder who exactly, if anyone, was watching the local news at 7 a.m. Also, while a couple of the hosts of these shows were real cool and genuinely enthusiastic about the book, most of them didn't get me or the whole idea behind found. Yet this only increased their chipperness and jaunty dawn enthusiasm. Those pants are so fun, they'd say, looking me up and down. Plaid pants, you're fun, huh? What kept me excited about these TV gigs was getting to meet and hang out with the other folks who were my fellow guests on the morning shows. These were local chefs with recipes of the week, mayoral candidates, a team of Irish dancers, a kid with an 80-pound pumpkin. In Baltimore, on Fox 5's Good Morning Baltimore, I did my little found song and dance. Then the anchor asked me to stay on her couch while she brought up the next guest, Baltimore's best mom. This is right before Mother's Day. 
Baltimore's best mom turned out to be an 87-year-old woman named Darnella Cole. She sat next to me on the couch. On the far side of her sat her 50-year-old son, Dice. Darnelda had no idea why she'd been asked to come on TV. They had plotted this as a surprise. Darnelda, uh, the anchor, asked Dice Cole to read the letter he'd written, you know, nominating his mom for the prize. And he did so, and Darnelda grew weepy. At last, the anchor declared Darnelda Baltimore's best mom and produced an oversized plaque and presented it to her, at which point Darnelda fell sobbing into my arms. I gave her a wild bear hug caught up in the moment. The anchor woman joined our embrace. Dice, meanwhile, had lit up a cigarette, <laughs> which an alarm producer raced over and doused with water. Darnella took this in and began hollering at her son and whacking him with her new plaque. <laughs> Dice, you can't smoke in here. This is TV we're making. What you thinking, boy? Put that damn thing out. <laughs> There were other high points. <laughs> and by high points, I mean low points for the stations and their guests. In Cleveland, two city parks employees showed off an injured hawk and falcon they'd rescued and rehabilitated. Then the falcon got loose and started flapping about, crapping on everything. <laughs> the anchors had to forge on to the local news and sports and weather, while the falcon continued to dive bomb them, rationing its poop so it had enough to drip a few drops on them with every sortie. It was amazing. <laughs> In Chicago, a young soccer champ, when they invited on to demonstrate his fancy moves, booted a ball off the wall of the set, knocking it over backwards, revealing the fact that we were not actually in the host's living room, as it might appear, but in the middle of a big dang concrete hangar. <laughs> in Phoenix, I was sandwiched on air between Cedric the Entertainer and the governor of Arizona. Cedric came on right before me, dropped a couple F-bombs, and then sheepishly left, telling his chaperone, I didn't mean to say that shit, it just came out, I swear to God. <laughs> Often my brother and I, you know, we do a found event in one city, hit the road for seven hours, taking turns driving all night, and get to the TV station parking lot in Louisville in Milwaukee around 4 a.m. for a couple hours of sleep before it was time for me to unfold myself, clomp inside all rumpled and bleary-eyed, and do my thing for 90 seconds on air. In the wee hours, security guards in the station lots would poke flashlights in our van windows and roust us, and I'd explain I was going to be a guest on the morning show. And they'd disappear for 20 minutes to check into it, then come back and wake us again to tell us that things had checked out and everything was cool. In Seattle, after a young security guard played this game with us, asked if I could come inside to use the John. We ended up talking for a while. His name was Pico. It turned out the station was moving soon to brand new larger digs, and that Pico was going to be replaced by an automatic gate with a swipe card. Pico asked why I was going to be on the morning show, and I explained to him the whole idea behind found. Notes and letters that people had found and sent into me. Little scraps that gave a glimpse into the lives of strangers. Pico got excited. He told me that earlier that very same night, had been sifting through boxes that were being tossed out before the station's big move. Just looking for mugs, t-shirts, old calculators, anything of value. And he'd found a bunch of racy notes from the morning show's old dour anchorman to a young camerawoman. <laughs> we galloped out back to the dumpsters and mucked about until we found the stack of steamy pages. You should read some of these on the show, Pico cried. <laughs> I resisted for a bit, but Pico was vehement. This guy's a class A asshole, he said. I'm telling you, he got a janitor fired for throwing out his lucky tie that he left on the bathroom floor. She had worked here eight years. Three hours later, we were on the air. <laughs> the anchorman was turning to me with a grumpy look. So tell me about this trash. Tell me about this book. You collect trash, trashy trash. One person's treasure is another's treasure. He might very well have been drunk at 7.15 in the morning. <laughs> Respect. Yes, sir, I said, people are finding this stuff all over the country and sending it into me. Some of it's hilarious, some of it's heartbreaking. It's amazing how powerfully you can get a sense of someone just from some little ripped piece of paper you pick up off the grass, like this one, for example. <laughs> I held his note up high and read it out loud. Stacy, you've got a rack on you, now that's a pair. I will nibble, lick, suck, and feast on them. Quit playing hard to get. <laughs> <laughs> What an expression that fellow had on his face. <laughs> Back in the lobby, Pico stood with two janitors by a big TV. And as I walked past them out into the bright, blurry morning sun, Pico smiled, gave me a nod, and said with pleasure, good job, man, good job. Thank you. All right, let me, I'm going to wrap up with one, one last all-time favorite find. And uh, later, later, if we have a moment, as some of the bands are coming on and off, maybe I'll share a few more finds with you. But, but this one came from Providence, Rhode Island. 
And sometimes you'll get to meet the people who, who have found the stuff and sent it to us. Um, so uh, this find, I, I meet the people who found the stuff. It's in the magazines, it's in the books, and it's such a, a joy to hear about the details of where they found this. And this woman found this in her front yard, she told me. This note in kids' handwriting, uh, the wind had just blown it into her lawn. It says, Adventure Club. Adventure Club. How to get into the club. You need to know how to climb a fence. You need to like adventure. And then the rules. No messing up the club. Don't bring anything in without permission from Shane or Ethan. You have to be nice to squirrels. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, most importantly, you can't tell anyone where or what the club is. So the woman that found this, like she thought she might know who Shane and Ethan were. Just some of the neighborhood kids. She'd see them running around with their friends. So she went up to them on the street a few days later and started asking them about the adventure club and reciting all these top secret rules. So the kids are shocked, you know, like how does she know all this classified information? She told them that her dog named Kismet had overheard them making up the rules. <laughs> the kids were speechless. And then when she, as they were walking away, she heard the youngest one say to his friend, whoa, Kismet hurt us. <laughs> so, you know, years have passed. We saw this woman last fall. She said, you know, these kids are probably 19, 20 years old now. She still likes to imagine them being really secretive around any dog after that. <laughs> Thanks so much, you guys. Yeah.